Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson seven of the platform specific series of my 8086 assembly programmer tutorials. Today, we're going to be back on DOS and we're going to be looking at the mouse. We're going to learn how to read in the mouse, and rather unfortunately, we are going to have to use the interruptive time. I don't know any magic tricks to read in the mouse directly, so um, it's going to be interruptivity this time. We're going to just let the, um, let the BIOS and things do all the work for us. Anyway, we should have some fun here, and um, reading in the mouse could make for some nice, interesting games. Um, I'm working on a um, sort of a rail shooter, a bit like Operation Wolf, on the um, 8 bits at the moment. It's not coming to DOS, I'm afraid, but you could certainly do some something like that with the um, reading routines for today. Also, you could create a nice point and click adventure, which the DOS systems were very good at. Let's go over to our source code and let's have a look at today's example. Okay, so we're going to have a lot of different options that we can read in today. So let's fire up the example and let's see what we can see. So here is the example. Now you can see here, we've got a visible mouse cursor on the screen here. And um, this is not the code I've written drawing this mouse cursor in pixels. This is a hardware mouse cursor. And I've also set a range, it's limited. And no matter how much I push to the left, I can't go outside of the left hand side and the right. We've got this little box defined as a limited range here. And you can see here, we've got various values here. Now in these examples here, CX and DX will be the X and Y position of the mouse relative to the screen up here. And then the second values here will be the actual movement size so if, we'll see that in just a moment once I recapture my mouse cursor. And BX here will be the um, left and right and middle mouse buttons. So you can see here as I'm moving to the right, these bottom CX and DX here are changing accordingly. So if I move to the left, CX is minus. If I move up, DX is minus. If I move quickly to the right, you'll see it, they, CX changes to a very high number, but they turn to zero when I stop moving. Now, if I press the left and right and indeed middle mouse buttons here, you can see BX at the top there is changing, so they're being read in. Um, and CX and DX at the top there are the actual position relative to the screen. So you can see here I'm at the top left of the limited window here, and you can see they say 4020 there. Um, and you can see even though I can't move any further to the top or the left here, the CX and DX at the top are the same, but the second versions, which are the movement amounts, are still changing. They're still reading in that I'm moving the mouse, even though the mouse cursor can't move. Okay, so that's um, essentially what we're going to be looking at today. So here's our mouse routines. Now, all of the mouse routines are done with interrupt 33H in hexadecimal, that is. So we're going to be using this, and um, AX is going to define the function we're going to use. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to reset that mouse. We're going to set it back to defaults just so we get everything um, in a good fixed state to start with. And then we're going to display the mouse cursor. And this is function one. And that will show our mouse cursor that you just saw. Now we can turn that off at any time. We can just use in AX equals two here, and that will turn the mouse cursor off. Of course, we didn't need to turn it on in the first place. I'm just showing the function. So now the mouse cursor is off, but of course you can still see the coordinates are being read in, even though the mouse cursor isn't visible. So if you want to create your own game mouse cursor, you know, like a crosshair or something, you certainly can do that. So we've got those options for displaying and hiding the mouse cursor. Now you'll notice that I was limiting the movement to a specific range here. Uh, we can turn that off. I was using options eight and seven here. We specified a range, a minimum and a maximum in CX and DX. Um, option seven was setting the horizontal range and option eight was setting the vertical range. But if I turn these off and I run again, well, you can see now we have full range of the screen here. You can see we can now move all the way around the screen. So we now can move anywhere we want. And so of course, if we wanted the control of the player to work within a specific window and the bottom was for sort of text, you know, say like a point and click text adventure or something, we can do that if that's what we want. We can force the cursor to move to a specific position um, using option four here in AX. And so we just set the X and Y position in CX and DX and that will move us to that position. Now, another thing we might want to do is we might to want to change the movement speed of the mouse cursor. And we can do that with option F, that's option 15, of course, and the option F in hexadecimal there. Apparently the um, cursor movement speed is measured in something known as Mickey's, which is in fact a Mickey Mouse joke. So there we go. Um, yeah, it's very funny. So um, the default speed is eight horizontally and 16 vertically, I believe. So that is the default. Um, and you can see that's actually pretty fast. And um, that's quite a fast speed. If we want to slow things down, I can just uh, make this number higher. Let's make it crazy high. And now we will really have to drag that mouse to um, to get it to move across the screen. Yeah, that's a really slow mouse. So there you go, you can configure it to be whatever you feel appropriate for your game. And as I say, the official measurement unit is apparently a Mickey. So there we go. 
Um, right, so that's how we actually initialize our mouse with some basic settings. Um, how about what, when we actually want to read them? Well, again, we've got some text initialization here. This is just to move the text cursor to the top of the screen. So we write the monitor in the same position every instance. Now, when we want to read in the cursor, we just set AX to three here and use interrupt 33 again. And this will read in the logical position of the cursor, whether it's shown or not, in CX and DX. So that's relative to the screen coordinates. Now you can actually set a screen range that is actually bigger than the, the real screen. You can set it to zero, zero and a thousand, a thousand if you want, it will work. But um, as I say, it's relative to the defined range here when you use option three here. That will read in CX and DX as the X and Y. It will also read the buttons left, right and centre in BL or BX if you prefer, just look at it like that way. The other bits in BX are unused there. So that's what we're doing first and we're showing that to the screen. We're then clearing BX and we're doing that to make a point because we're then going to use the alternate option and that's option B. So we set AX to B in hexadecimal and run into up 33 again. And this will read in the horizontal and vertical relative movement compared to the last read. But the buttons aren't read in so we're clearing BX there just to make that point. And that's this second one down here. So as I move to the right, you can see CX is changing. And if I move up, you can see DX is negative. But if I press those uh, mouse buttons, BX doesn't change because it's not read in. So you would need to use both of those commands, I guess, if you read, need, want to read the um, mouse buttons themselves. But uh, obviously, this, which of these you want to use is going to be um, depending on what your game is. You know, if you're creating a point and click adventure, then um, you're probably going to want to read in a real position relative to the screen. Whereas if you're creating a um, first person shooter, if you're really that uh, clever, I mean, well done to you if you are, but you, you would want to, um, you would want to use this second option because this one will give a relative movement and you can keep dragging the mouse to the right infinitely and you will keep getting those relative movements so that you can keep your game character turning around. You wouldn't want them to get stuck just because the logical mouse cursor has hit the limits of the screen. So there we go. So that's the basic options here. Now there are a few other options regarding relating to mouse cursors and things that are not something I'm going to be covering here. Um, I couldn't actually find any documentation on how to define cursors at hardware cursors. I'm don't if I'm misunderstanding and that's impossible. I kind of thought maybe you could, but I couldn't find anything on that. It might be easier just to use a software cursor and draw it with a bitmap graphic if you were trying to do something like that. But anyway, the point I'm really making is if you really need to go into depth in this, you, you probably want to have a look at the um, DOS documentation out there and um, maybe read more further into it. But I think um, we've had a, a good look today at the basics and learned how to get some simple mouse movement and um, things going on so you could use them in your game. So there we go. Um, as always, please go to the website. You can download today's source code and you can have a go with it. And if you manage to make any use of it, just go ahead. I mean, uh, really all I've done is um, put into effect the stuff that's in a lot of the old documentation that you can find on the web. So I've hardly done anything particularly clever here. Anyway, if you've liked what you've seen today, please hit the like on the video because liking the videos shows them to more people and please subscribe because um, the, the DOS system isn't one of my major ones. Um, I don't have a lot of time for making tutorials and I tend to focus on the Z80, 652 and 68000. That's what my patrons tend to be supporting. So if you want to see more DOS, please make sure you subscribe because uh, I will, um, I, I tend to create content based on what people seem to be enjoying. And if a video is getting a lot of views and getting me a lot of subs, there will be more of it and if it's not really getting very much then I'm going to focus on the stuff that works better so make sure you um, make sure you like and subscribe if this is what you want to see more of and then you probably will anyway thanks for watching today goodbye now if you've enjoyed this video today please consider supporting my content it takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos it's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job and it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue justify doing it essentially you can back me on patreon I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing you can see one here and also the newest videos there's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons although they will all be available to everyone later on and also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future what new content to create and things like that you can see there was a recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content as well as patreon you can now become a member of my channel on youtube there's a join button you should see just below this video you can use that YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon. I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon. It's the same content every week. 
Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you'd like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.